This episode was sponsored by Skillshare. Do you want to be more creative? Sure, we all do. So sign up now for the online learning community for creatives, Skillshare, and find out how easy it is to explore new skills. Sign up now for any one of these online classes. Video editing, cinematography basics, live DJing, bookkeeping for freelancers, building your own websites, creative nonfiction, and so much more. Or you can learn how to write creative essays from best-selling author Roxanne Gay herself. There are no ads, and best of all, the first 500 people to use my link will get access to one of Skillshare's best offers. 30 days free and 40% off your first year of Skillshare membership. So make this important click right now. Click now for the special offer Todd in the Shadow spoke about. All right, and now the video. To yet another one hit wonder and spectacular edition! <sighs> On and off, I have tried to find Halloween related one hit wonders, increasingly less through the years since there are only so many. Which is funny because there was one really obvious one that I've resisted because, in my opinion, it doesn't really count. But, oh. I see, once again, there's a little horror franchise getting a boost right now. So I think I gotta. The power of Christ compels me. Yes, Tubula Bells. Best known to you, probably, as the theme to The Exorcist. Now, I know some of you are asking, wait, The Exorcist theme? That was a hit single? That can't be. Oh, it was. It very much was. People walked out of The Exorcist, one of the most disturbing blockbuster movies of all time. Infamous for making viewers pass out from shock in the theaters. There indeed are at least a dozen people who faint or become ill during every showing. And as these moviegoers got up out of the puddle of their own puke, they were like, you know that creepy music playing in the credits? I'm gonna go out and buy it on a 7-inch vinyl record, and I'm gonna play it at parties and mixers for my friends. And that's exactly what happened. As The Exorcist became a box office phenomenon, so too did its theme song fly off the shelves, demonically rising up the charts until it reached the top 10 in the spring of 1974. It would be the biggest, first, last, and only entry in the Hot 100 for its artist, a precocious teenage prodigy named Mike Oldfield. Now this is a funny one to cover because I'd say a lot of you have never heard of this guy whatsoever, but another big chunk of you are super pissed off at me right now. <sighs> yes, I know that no one thinks of Mike Oldfield as a one-hit wonder. There are far more and better measures of hits than just the American singles charts. By that definition, Jimi Hendrix is a one-hit wonder. I know, that's why I haven't covered him before. But god damn it, there's another shitty Exorcist sequel in theaters. I feel Halloweeny. Tis the damn season. So, much like Linda Blair, we're gonna bend a little on this. So, for the moment, let us appreciate the long, creepy shadow of the tubular bells, an absolutely towering piece of work in multiple genres, and we will try and keep it vaguely Halloween related. Your mother sucks, Coxonel! All right, believe it or not, I think this is actually my first attempt to cover progressive rock. It's kind of hard to cover because every band in it is an unstable mess. I think at one point Emerson, Lake, and Polymer was actually five lute players named Johnson. Anyway, one of these messy bands was a psychedelic British act named Soft Machine, semi-big in the late 60s. Their lead guitarist, Kevin Ayers, quit after their first album naturally, and he started his own band, where he was the first to notice the talent of a young musical savant named Mike Oldfield. Oldfield was 15, he was self-taught, he played about 400 instruments. Ayers took him under his wing, and Oldfield backed him up for a few years until 1972, where Oldfield, at age 19, was clearly now a seasoned old pro ready to strike out on his own. He struggled for a little bit, shopping around his demos, and eventually found another precocious upstart ready to take a chance on him. A small record store owner and budding entrepreneur barely older than him named Richard Branson. 
Branson was not super convinced that Oldfield's weird instrumentals had any potential, but his people sold him on it, and when Branson couldn't get any major labels to bite, he started his own label, which is the beginning of a separate story that ends with Richard Branson being one of the richest men alive. Tubular Bells is probably the only record that has ever put a man into outer space, but that's decades down the line. As of right now, we're towards the end of 1973. The album has been out for months, and despite the coolest cover art of all time, it's not really expected to do anything. It's not really packed with hits, if you follow. Surprisingly, it is kind of slow burning up the UK charts, which is nice, but no one really expects more than that. But true chart salvation is just around the corner. Somewhere between science and superstition, there is another world. Director William Friedkin is making a horror movie, and as of right now, the soundtrack is a blaring atonal mess that he hates completely, and he's thrown it all out. So now he's digging through a pile of classical records, trying to cobble together a new score. Specifically, he's looking for something that kinda sounds like Brahms' lullaby. Something that'll sound eerie in the right context, when he finds a mysterious, unlabeled record in the pile. So, The Exorcist was a monster hit, especially for a horror movie. Compared to like Texas Chainsaw or Halloween, those were very successful sleeper hit indie movies. But The Exorcist was Star Wars big right out of the gate. My dad remembers being in a line around the block, having to wait through a whole other showing of the movie, because that's how movie tickets worked back then, just to watch it. And back then, movie scores could also become big hits. Star Wars, Rocky, Close Encounters, all charted. But the thing about the Exorcist theme that gets me is that it's not actually all that prominent in the movie. The Star Wars theme is the first thing you hear. It immediately blasts you into the film. The Rocky theme soundtracks the greatest montage in film history. The Exorcist theme? Shows up for a few seconds in the background of a couple scenes for atmosphere and again in the end credits, but only after a different piece of music. You might have already left by that point. From that alone, you wouldn't think it memorable enough to hit the pop charts, but no, it absolutely is that striking, that quickly. This is how it wound up in the top 10 with The Carpenters and Gladys Knight and the Pips. Did this actually get played on the radio? I wish I knew. But enough about the movie. Let's listen to the track itself, which has much, much more significance than being just a movie theme. It's a very complex work of art, and unfortunately I'm dumb as a brick with terrible taste, so I don't know if I have any useful observations, but I'll try. So I've been aware of this song, obviously, but this is my first time trying to listen, listen to it, rather than just absorbing it passively. And the first rational observation I have of it is, I notice there are no tubular bells in it. Or wait, shit, is there? Fuck, I can't tell. Okay, see, I know that there are definitely tubular bells in the full version, but the single version, like a lot of prog rock singles, had to be edited down. And by edited down, I mean from 49 minutes long. The actual Tubular Bells is a full album piece, separated into two parts. If not for the limitations of vinyl, I'm betting it'd probably be one part. Tubular Bells definitely show up in it, most famously towards the end of Side A. Mandolin introducing acoustic guitar, plus Tubular Bells. Tubular. But in the Exorcist theme part, I don't know. In the back of my mind, I'd always assume the main part was Tubular Bells, even though there was another nagging part of my brain that knows what tubular bells sound like. Like, uh, I, got a, I got a tubular bell setting on this thing. Here. So that's what that sounds like. Like these are, that's an organ and a glockenspiel. Actually, hold on, is that big clonk a tubular bell? Part of the mythology of tubular bells is that to get the sound he wanted, Oldfield just whacked those suckers with an actual hammer till they broke. Guess that's how they wound up in that shape. And that definitely sounds like something getting hit with a hammer. This is gonna drive me crazy. This song was always destined to be a horror movie theme, by the way. It has its own scare chord. Like, check out this fan edit I found on YouTube. Ah! Brilliant. 
Part of what makes Tubular Bells so unsettling is its time signature. I've always kind of preferred the Halloween theme, honestly, but listening to them back to back now, I realize that Halloween is just the amateur garage band version of Tubular Bells. I mean, Tubular Bells, even just the part of it that you recognize, is all over the place. It sounds like it should be in 7-8, which is already a difficult time signature. But look at this, it's a 7-8 and then an 8-8. Eight, eight. So really it's a 15-8. If that was how time signatures worked, which they don't. Just trying to play that simplified piano version just now, that extra beat fucks me up. I can't imagine how hard it must be to perform the entire goddamn thing. Oldfield did a TV special playing it, and it was so difficult that Branson had to bribe him with a new Bentley just to keep him from bailing on it. So obviously it's an impressive composition, but how does it become a pop hit? How does an avant-garde instrumental piece with a lifetime association with Vomit end up sharing chart space with Hooked on a Feeling and Benny and the Jets? Okay, being fair, it's not that creepy outside of the movie. Out of context, it does seem less outright satanic and more mystical and pagan. In fact, my first association with Tubular Bells was not The Exorcist. Before I was old enough to watch that movie, I knew it from a commercial that used to play all the time in the 90s for a compilation of new age music. Set adrift with the timeless pleasures of Tubular Bells. The timeless pleasures. In fact, some people have called Tubular Bells the first big new age record. Uh, I'm not sure I'd call it that. I, I don't even know what new age music really is, but as far as I can tell, it's kind of like if progressive rock didn't have any rock in it. That's how I define it, at least. And Tubular Bells fucking rocks too hard. There's too much kick-ass guitar in it. That bass line is too goddamn awesome. Tubular Bells was actually already starting to climb in the UK via word of mouth, but The Exorcist busted it wide open. So it climbed and climbed until it finally topped the album charts in the fall of 74. Also, it's an absolute classic that every record geek on earth will tell you to buy. Again, this kid was barely old enough to drive. Clearly, he had time to have more success, but how on earth do you follow something like this? So, in the US, Tubular Bells went top 10, the album went gold, that's pretty good. After that, he doesn't really make many waves over here, so you had to be a real music geek to know who he was. In the UK, meanwhile, Tubular Bells was about as big as Dark Side of the Fucking Moon. Huge. Huge. And you don't fuck with the formula, obviously, even when your formula is as experimental as that. So the follow-up was a continuing series of dense instrumental albums, none of which can really be said to have songs on them per se. Now, I'm not gonna go in depth on those, Quite frankly, I am not good enough a critic. If you want that, get Mike the Snare to do it. <sighs> Way over my head on this one. I will note that those albums are much mellower than Tubular Bells. They were successful, but they didn't really capture people's imaginations the same way, and Oldfield ended up a little worried that he'd expended all his big ideas all at once. For the record, I liked the third album, Mamadon, a lot. I think that one's pretty good. And if these albums weren't quite as well remembered as Tubular Bells, well, Maybe the British record-buying public only had room for one experimental instrumental album in their hearts. But this is a show about singles, not albums. And Mike Oldfield only became a singles artist against his will. He never authorized the short version of Tubular Bells, and he was pretty upset about it. In response, he released his own single, literally titled Mike Oldfield's Single, the original Taylor's version, which is an excerpt from a completely different part of the album that sounds nothing like the hit version. So, hearing all that, I figured he probably never released a single again, and the rest of the episode would be pretty easy. I was wrong. To my surprise, in between his second and third albums, he did try and release another single. Something called Don Alfonso, I guess it's from an opera or something from the looks of it, and Oldfield recruited an actual vocalist for this one, since the human voice is the one it's when he doesn't really play. That's his conductor, David Bedford, also an avant-garde composer, and sings, I guess. Yeah, this is already way too classy for me. I lost my opera hat in the move. But anyway, here it is. Now I'm a Toreador, I am for sure. I kill bulls by the score, and sometimes more. And when they hear the bull 
bikes all start trembling. They know I'm coming. I, I, I feel like my head's about to spin around backwards. What? She told me she was single. It made me tingle. I think it says something about me as a critic that this is immediately the most interesting part of Mike Oldfield's career to me. I need to know everything about how Oldfield followed up his masterpiece Tubular Bells with a novelty song about a shitty bullfighter. I, I love this French release single cover too, by the way. Don Alfonso by Mike Oldfield. Yes, Mike Oldfield. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's not a lot of info about how this happened. Oldfield does not seem to have commented on this ever, so I have no idea what led him here. How, how, how did this happen? Shockingly, Don Alfonso did about as well selling records as he did fighting bulls, so this did nothing. But surprisingly enough, Mike Oldfield did manage to get some more hits during the 70s. One of them is an instrumental version of an old Christmas carol that did well during the holidays, 75. Another, a remake of the old English folk tune, Portsmouth. Yeah, I don't get it. But uh, they count as hits, at least. Sadly, as the prog rock era came to a close, the UK became possessed by another demon. I am an antichrist! Yes, Richard Branson and Virgin Records pivoted to punk, which left Oldfield feeling pretty left out. Would Oldfield lose his faith? Now, even with his couple follow-up hits, Oldfield obviously wasn't much of a singles artist. Now, normally, when I cover a British act on here, I find out that they have a whole mess of other notable singles back home. I thought, for sure, for sure, Mike Oldfield would not be one of them. So let us now look into the next phase of Mike Oldfield's career, 80s pop star. Okay, star might be overdoing it, but his albums did start mixing in actual songs between the 20 minute instrumentals. I don't know why I'm so surprised by this. A bunch of prog rock guys became big pop stars in the 80s, partially because they were way ahead of the curve on synthesizers, Mike Oldfield included. Now most of his songs were not hugely successful, but a couple of them very much were. Here's one you might know. This sounds familiar, you might know it better from the Hall and Oates cover version. Here's the thing, I knew this was a Mike Oldfield cover and I never put it together that it was the same guy. In my defense, the tubular bells guy writing hits for Hall and Oates doesn't make any goddamn sense. The other really noteworthy single was this one. This was a huge hit throughout all of Europe. In fact, I think most of Europe thinks of this as his big hit single. Now this strikes me as an unlikely hit in 1982, but Kate Bush is also a big hit maker over there, so uh, you know what, sure, I guess. Mike put out many other pop singles throughout the 80s, with featured singers like John Anderson from Yes and Bonnie Tyler of Total Eclipse of the Heart fame. A lot of his songs did better in mainland Europe rather than the UK. Um, I don't know for sure how his diehard fans felt about his pop stuff, but I do get the sense that by the late 80s, they all agree that this stuff was uh, shit. You need the blue. Good. In 1989, he made an entire album of pop songs, and all of Mike Oldfield's fans seem to fucking hate it. I watched a BBC documentary about the guy, and they outright refused to talk about the 80s, except to say that his career was ruined by going to therapy and getting his head right. The music that Michael made was, was the grist of his pain. Since that rebirthing thing, he's found it very hard to reach the places where the 
real music came from. What a horrible thing to say. But they're seriously just horrified. Mm. He's got no clothes on on the front of music mags. He's doing a version of the Blue Peter theme. They get to the part where Old Field starts covering ABBA and children's TV themes and they're just disgusted and then they skip directly to the 90s. Okay, I don't want to make it seem like all he did in the 80s was sell out. He also wrote the score for the delightful little genocide movie, The Killing Fields. For the record, he says that his shitty late 80s stuff was Branson's fault. And once he was free from Virgin Records, he just kept on recording tons of more shit right up to the present day. Apparently you gamer geeks know this one pretty well. But Tubular Bells remains his masterwork, and just like The Exorcist, it had a bunch of sequels also. Probably better sequels than The Exorcist had. He had a sort of comeback with Tubular Bells 2, including yet another top 10 single excerpted from it. This is 1992, so naturally this is a very Enya sounding version of the original. And he's revived it several times since, including playing it during the opening ceremony of the London Olympics. Okay, there are definitely some tubular bells in this version. I see them. Mike Oldfield is not really a one-hit wonder. He's only on the show because of a technicality, so did he deserve better? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't really know how to answer that. I guess he could have been a little better known in America. If you're an art rock geek though, you probably already know him pretty well. And if you didn't, now you do. Mike Oldfield announced his retirement earlier this year, and while he has had many phases of his career, Tubular Bells, even still, remains his magnum opus. It's the thing he's going to be remembered for forever. And as long as they keep pumping out shitty Exorcist sequels, you will hear it on every Halloween playlist for the rest of your life. What an excellent day for an exorcism. Yeah.